Hello everyone, Jose Rodriguez here. The Epson SureColor P800 or the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000. Which one should you get? Well, if you're like me, I own both of them. And to tell you the truth, there is no way that I can live without either one. I love them all the same. Each printer presents pros and cons. And again, both of them being excellent producers of photo prints. But there are ways that you can arrive at a decision, possibly, it's hard, as to which one to buy. Let's just backtrack a little bit. So you are probably an amateur photographer, a professional photographer. You are tired of dealing with those external labs that seem to have you go back and forth because they don't seem to be able to get that print from your perfect image to look the way you wish. And so you have decided to do this at home so you can have the full control of the complete process. So say you want to print 17 inch wide and whatever. Well, that whatever depends on which printer you choose. If it's the Pro 1000, that whatever is not much more beyond 25 inches. Let's say you're gonna be producing lots of prints, 17 by 22s or 17 by 25s, and you can buy paper that is pre-cut. Red River has some of this paper for you in large cut sheets already to be printed upon. The Epson P800 allows you to use a roll. And as you saw on my thumbnail, I showed you that very printer happily holding on to that roll adapter in the back. And that roll adapter is not that flimsy type adapter that a lot of the 13 inch wide capacity Epson printers provide for you. Not at all. This thing is a well-engineered and heavy duty unit, although it does not have a cutter. So you have to do that function yourself. But so far I have been loving it and I managed to get mine on eBay way back for $150 rather than the two something it sells for. Now, what are the reasons why you would choose one over the other? Let's talk about print quality. Very subtle differences and not something that you're gonna be able to tell immediately. Each printer has the capability to exceed the output of the other depending on the images that you print and the media that you print on. The P800 is a nine color printer. It has two blacks, matte black, photo black, but shares only one black channel. It has yellow, light magenta, light cyan, magenta, cyan, and then two grays and the two blacks. This girl right here has chroma optimizer, 12 cartridges. The chroma optimizer helps at certain times when you are printing on papers with a sheen. The P800 has very good gloss characteristics, but has been shown to have a little bit of gloss differential, depending on what type of media you print on. The Pro 1000 from Canon, like I mentioned, has 12 cartridges, chroma optimizer, yellow, photo and regular cyan, photo and regular magenta, red ink, blue ink, and these two colors are dedicated colors so that it allows the printer to not have to rely on compositing magenta and yellow. After a certain level of red is reached, it triggers that red ink and you get really, really good reds. The blue comes in at a slightly better quality than the P800 in my viewpoint. Some people will totally disagree with me but I have certain images where there's a certain blue that just simply cannot be reproduced by a regular nine color printer. You need a printer with a dedicated blue ink to be able to hit that just right. And of course, a profile will diminish that need, but still it is visible with this baby right here. Now, one other thing that is an advantage and a plus for the Pro 1000, of course, is the 12 channel print head doesn't have to share the black channel. So whenever matte black is called for, it will trigger it immediately and it will just use it without having to go through the valve system that the Epson uses in order to switch back and forth 
from photo black to matte black that wastes a bit of ink as well. Now, talking about waste, this printer has timed cleaning cycles. It's a very confusing, but again, at the same time, simple process. Every 60 hours, 120 hours, 240 and 480 hours from the most recent cleaning cycle. As soon as you exceed any of those time frames, it will trigger a preceding cleaning cycle before the print job even begins to print. So let me try to explain that a little bit easier to, to grasp. Say today is Monday and at noon, I manually ran a cleaning cycle for whatever the reason, if only to set that clock back to zero and the clock starts to tick. So I'll give you two scenarios. I do not print for the next two and a half days. And right at the 60 hour and one minute time frame, I send a print job. That print job will use a certain amount of ink, but before it even begins to print, it will trigger a cleaning cycle. That cleaning cycle will use up more ink than the ink that I use for my print, even a 17 by 22. It's a beginning to make sense now why you should actually print during that idle period. I hope it is. There's a lot more to that, but the concept of thinking that you're going to save ink by not printing because ink is so expensive, you want to, you know, curtail your print jobs. Oh, I'm only going to use the printer, you know, just once in a while. That way I can save a ton of ink. That's not going to work in this type of printer. Canon printers will not allow that to happen. They will run those cleaning cycles so that it remains free flowing and clog free. So yeah, but but both printers have user replaceable maintenance cards. But if you just print more images between those idle periods, the proportion of ink that you will use to lay on paper, which is really what we want the printer for, if you're not going to print, don't get any of these printers. You better be printing, dare I say, daily, okay, to get the most out of these printers. Lesser printers, mm, you don't have to worry so much. But these two big babies right here, you really need to print daily to get the most bang for the buck out of these two printers. Now, if you print daily from the Monday at 12 noon, until Wednesday at 12 midnight, I think that would be two and a half days. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, you get it, 60 hours. If you produce a lot of prints, none of those prints will develop a cleaning cycle prior to printing. They'll just print. You will hear the agitation of the ink if needed. That's not a cleaning cycle. You will hear the hum of the vacuum advance. That's not a cleaning cycle. You will hear the print head moving back and forth. That's not a cleaning cycle. Big difference between those noises and what a true cleaning cycle sounds like. So if you print from hour or minute one after 12 noon Monday until Wednesday midnight, you will not develop a cleaning cycle. So produce a lot of prints between that period of time. So that after midnight, say next morning, your next print job, yeah, it will develop a cleaning cycle. But it needs to do that. Whether you agree with it or not, or I agree with it or not, the printer needs to do that. So it's going to do it regardless of what we try to do to intervene that process. So again, print, print, print. Put more ink on paper than you will use on these timed cleaning cycles. If you wait beyond the two and a half days and you go past that five day mark, that's 120 hours. That's a larger cleaning cycle. Okay, you get what I mean? So don't let that scare you into not printing. Print, print because it's gonna happen regardless. All right, PA-100, not so bad. PA-100 will not do that to you. They will run a preemptive cleaning cycle, but it has to like sit unused for at least two weeks. And that's what's happened to me often. I don't use that printer so much anymore because I have relatively good paper roll, uh, type paper installed on it. And I don't want to use that paper or have to 
uninstall that role every time I want to run a test sprint or run something. I'm going to go ahead and print on it whenever I need to. I'm using this one more often than that one, to tell you the truth at this point, because I've been using this to print on matte media, that aquarella paper from Canson. I've been using that to produce photos for sale. Well, the P800 right now is loaded with luster paper. So unless I need a luster print, I'm not going to use it at this point. But anyway, regardless, whether I don't print for a week or two weeks, I may have a preemptive clean cycle. So ink economy will probably be a lot better than the Pro 1000. If this doesn't bother you, if you're going to be printing daily and you want top quality prints, prints that can generate excellent results on images containing lots of deep reds and blues and purples, this might be a little bit better than the P800. P800 is not far behind, even with its limited ink set. Like I said, you're not going to be able to really see big differences on most, probably 99% of your images. But the big deal with the P800 is that, and by the way, before I even discuss that, we're talking about OEM inks here. We're not talking about third-party inks, okay? So take that off you, off the uh, discussion plate. We're talking about printing on these two printers using original inks from either Epson or Canon. We're talking quality output here, and so we need to talk only about OEM. Now, the P800 has that roll adapter. With that roll adapter, and of course, it also has a maintenance cartridge that you can change. Both of them are relatively inexpensive, by the way. So that's not a problem that I would even consider, you know, debating over. The roll adapter and the ability to print beyond 26 inches. You would be shocked to know that the P800 can print 17 by something like 590 inches long. I set that up. I actually did. I set that up on Lightroom. And yeah, you can. It accepts it and even sets up a template for it to print. Now, that would be probably longer than my house. Yeah, so, you know, crazy, right? But anyway, it does have that ability with the roll adapter. You can print multiples using Q image layout. You can also print job after job after job by using the banner mode method. And then when you are done, hit done and cut. It will print a cut line. It will advance about six inches beyond the front tray. You'll be able to slice that off cleanly with a pair of scissors or a razor blade and trimming those prints off of that you know, 20 foot long length of paper, that's your job. But anyway, it allows you to do that. And then once you are done, basically you're done, finished, and it retracts the paper back to a position that will get it ready for the next job. It's not going to retract the paper completely. It's going to still be held under the top platen and the front transport. So the paper is going to be flat. And by the way, you know what the advantage of that would be? Say goodbye to printhead strikes. You're not going to suffer those problems anymore because that only occurs not so much on this printer because this has assisted vacuum advance. It still uses the same rollers, the same pizza wheels that any other printer uses, but it has that haul down help from the vacuum advance. And so the paper is held a little bit flatter. Prints like this done on stiff paper like that are not going to suffer from any head strikes. Only papers that have a little bit of curl. That will happen when you use cut sheets on the P800, on any printer. And that front edge rises up in the corners a little bit. Scrape. It will be hit by the printhead and cause some front leading edge strikes and possibly rear the trailing edge as well. So printing on a printer that allows you to use a roll, and you're going to be using that same media for multiple prints, will ensure that there's not going to be any chance of any head strikes due to paper curling because the paper is going to be loaded beyond that point where it could possibly curl. And then it'll just continue printing. It'll be held flat. It will be held without any kind of buckling or any sort of condition that will trigger a head strike. 
because that's a physical occurrence. That's when the paper is too high. There's only a few thousands of an inch difference between the bottom surface of the nozzle plate and the top surface of the paper. It's that close. So any kind of curl, any kind of buckle will cause a head strike, ruining your print, basically. And when we're talking about papers that are seven, eight dollars a sheet, you don't want that to happen too often. All right, so mechanical quality. Both printers are really, really good. The P800 has, I don't know what the terminology is, but very fancy, very fancy print head features that only the long hair types can get into. I'm not going to deal with that because I really don't know what they're talking about. I'm not that well trained in that aspect. I just look at my final results and that's where I make my judgment. Mechanically, the printer is awesome. It's, it's very well made. The only thing I would fault it on is, of course, the front tray on an Epson. I, I really don't like the way they designed that, where you lift it up and you kind of have to, you know, it's kind of a drawer and it's very flimsy and, and very weak. Whereas the Canon, I mean, this thing is just opens up this way. Boom, you're done. There's no pulling of any tray. There's no, you know, possibility of pulling it a little bit cockeyed and possibly jamming it. So I kind of prefer this type of paper feeder or tray, exit tray, than the Epson. The other difference with the Epson, and again, is just you learn how to use both printers. And so this little problem, if you will, becomes less and less important. The Epson, you have to align your paper to the right. There's a little guide on the right. You align the paper by pushing the left guide until it's touching the paper, making sure that it's aligned on the right guide. Whereas Canon printers center align. So they have variable adjustable guides that adjust toward the center. And that's always causing the paper to be fed from the central portion of the rolling system, which I think is a little bit better. I think it's a little bit better. P800 again is always feeding from the far right. Possibility, if you're grabbing the paper from the far right, something could cause it to skew. And some people have reported that. So not just one or two, many. So that is something you have to be aware of. Forget about this. If you think you're gonna load 50 sheets of 13 by 19 and walk away, don't even think about it. These are single print type printers. Whether they claim to or not, believe me, I've owned these for a long time. I know how they behave. You have to babysit those prints one at a time, folks. Have your box of paper here. If you want to go ahead and load, say, five copies, please don't load five sheets of paper one at a time. As soon as one of them clears and has cleared that feed, click, it goes like snap, and now it's feeding straight out. Insert your next sheet. Don't stack them up. I have had double sheet feeding, okay? So, you know, forget about doing that. Try not to do that. One sheet at a time, one print at a time, you will get consistent, beautiful results. Now, Epson allows you to create multiple custom sizes and then save them to the driver. Pro 1000, allows you to create different paper media configurations that can be saved to the drop-down menu in the custom tab. You will have a custom tab created and you will be able to save other manufacturers papers on there. So you no longer have to sort of match a similar type of paper because of the surface may be Proluster and you're dealing with a fine quality Burita and your only choice is Proluster or, or Semi-Gloss. You will not have to do that because you will configure the printer using the media configuration tool to create a custom setting that includes thickness of the material, how much ink density is applied and so forth. And on the Epson, you can't do that, but you can save lots of multiple sizes. And I love doing that, especially when I'm printing on roll. Not so with the Canon, you have to create your custom size every single time, unless you have a printing program like QImage that will allow you to save many, many presets for different size prints and different odd sizes. Speaking of odd sizes, whenever you choose a non 
standard size. In other words, you have to create one yourself. Then you can't print borderless. And besides, why would you want to do that anyway? It's bad for the printer. But anyway, just so you guys know that you can try till the cows come home when you create a custom paper size and then you choose borderless, you will lose all of the irregular sizes that you may have saved and you will only be able to access standard sizes. So no printing borderless on your custom made paper sizes. What about longevity? People want to know about longevity. Well, both printers will produce prints that will outlive you, possibly your kids as well, depending how you store your prints, how you display your prints. Display them outside in front of your bay window, and I don't care what inks you use, they will fade very quickly, especially in an area with high ozone. If you display them normally in your home, by normal, I mean under glass on a frame, maybe mounted on gator board, make sure that you place them on an area that doesn't receive a lot of daylight directly on it. Make sure that if you're going to display a print unprotected, I mean not inside a glass frame, then consider using a spray protectant. And that will save that print from the ravages of ozone oxidation, which is what causes inks to fade. And it's amazing how quick that will happen, depending on your conditions and where you live. So if you live in LA, if you live in a high industrial area with lots of smog, yeah, you're going to have to spray just about every print or store it under glass framed on the wall. That's the only thing that's going to save you. Now, should I even talk about it? Third-party inks and refilling systems. Well, like I said, if you're going to choose these two printers and these printers are able to produce ridiculously good results, why would you want to jeopardize that? Why? Why? Oh, because I can't afford the inks? Ah, uh, yeah. You have to think about that. You have to think about that. It's a commitment. If I told you that your car required $5 a gallon gas and you choose to use $2 a gallon gas, you're taking the chance that that gas is going to damage your printer. Well, that's not going to happen with ink, but that's just an example. Ink costs a lot of money. And so if you want the very best results, I mean, I hate to tell you, the only way to get them is with OEM ink. You know, I hate it as much as you do, but that's the only way. Third-party inks come close, but no cigar. Even Precision Color Signature Edition, even Ink Owl, high-definition inks for the Epson printer. Those are all excellent. John Cohn, all excellent inks. Some of them will be closely matched. Some of them will not be closely matched, meaning that the output will be distinctly different when you see side-by-side -side comparisons. Can you get close with profiling? Yeah, possibly, possibly. Will it be just as long lasting as OEM? Of course not. Absolutely not, by many, many time fold. So what do you do? Well, then you need to resort to certain things. You need to come up with a way to match that ink as well as you can to OEM. And you could do that via profiling. It's gotta be a really darn good profile to be able to get you close. I am using Precision Color Signature Edition here on just a few of the colors. The rest are OEM. The important ones are OEM. Why is that? Because Precision Color Signature Edition doesn't come close. Of course it does. It was designed to be seamless, but I also want to maintain my longevity in the important colors. And those are yellow and black. The same thing applies to the Epson, but that's a different animal over there. We'll get to that in a minute. Since you guys forced me to talk about third party. Okay, no, it was just me. Sorry, I apologize. Third party ink options for the P800, non-existent if you live in the US or North America generally. If you're all over the world, some other place other than the USA, you have a printer P800 that is zoned to your country. Yeah, you can use third party refillable cartridges and whatever ink you choose to use and may God help you, okay? Uh, today, I am using OEM inks on my printer. What happened to my original cartridges? Well, I took them out when they were half full. Took them out and saved them. I loaded a set of refillable cartridges that were sent to me by Precision Colors. I loaded them with PC 
K3HD inks, and I proceeded to happily print. The printer accepted them. Everything was hunky-dory. I was happy as a lark. Next thing you know, we start hearing reports that the cartridges are not resetting. Oh, boy, why are they not resetting? Is it faulty equipment? What is it? No. Each color has a distinct ID number. That printer, by virtue of its firmware for the USA and North America, wants to see what all the other printers should want to see as well, a different ID color every time you change a cartridge. It has nothing to do with the ink level indicator codes. Nothing to do with that. He wants to see a different code for, if I replace yellow with a new one, he has to see a different code for it. If he doesn't see that, then he will not accept that cartridge that just reset itself, supposedly, auto-reset type cartridge, nothing doing. That ID code lives in a read-only section of that smart chip. It cannot be rewritten. So you cannot rewrite that code to a different yellow code using even the same logical sequence of numbers, the same algorithm that Epson uses to generate those codes. It can't do that. It's only read, not write or rewrite. So you cannot rewrite a new code to it even if you wanted to, even if you were able to. They're single-use chips. So what are your choices? Well, right now I am running that baby for the next 30 full resets on a decoder board. That decoder board came with nine sets of codes pre-embedded into nine sets of chips that are actually molded in the board itself. I had to disconnect the chip reader ribbon cables from the printer and then plug them directly to that board. So now it thinks it's reading chips off of cartridges, but in reality, it doesn't realize that it's reading chips from that board. It has gone through the first set of ID codes and I am happy as a lark. I'm, I'm still printing on that printer. I'm able to fill it with OEM inks. Those refillable cartridges, I'm still using them. I just have them filled with OEM inks from where? large format cards that I buy for the upper generations of the sure color large format printers that use the same ink set. eBay has that. Just look for it. It's not going to be cheap, but it will save you some money and give you the luxury and convenience of using a refillable system. But you're still using OEM. And that board will give me 30 more full resets, 29 actually at this point. And I haven't even gotten past 80% of my first use of that board. So I think it's going to last me a long time. So anyway, that is your other and only choice for the P800 if you make that choice to go third party here in the U.S. How much does that board cost? Close to this, okay? So that is the only choice we have at this point. Are you sure you want to refill this? Well, if you can refill it with OEM cartridges, from say 700 ml cartridges of the Pro 1000, of the Pro 2000, 4000, or 6000, then yeah, no problem, go ahead and do that. Watch my videos on how to refill these cartridges. Take a look, one, two, three, four, five cartridges have been already changed. These are now empty. These are empty cards. I will be replacing the chips on those with auto reset chips and then I refill them using a vacuum or pressure method that I show you how to do. What inks should you use? Precision Colors Signature Edition. That's the only ink out there right now that I would trust on this printer. It incorporates OEM Yellow, OEM Red, and OEM Blue, plus OEM Chroma Optimizer. Why? Because no matter what source of inks they used, it did not match the quality of OEM. So he was forced to buy lots of those 700 ml cartridges in order to be able to aspirate 82 ml loads that he sells individually. And you can also go complete OEM if you wish. They will also sell you OEM loads on all 12 colors. All right, so which one would I get? Like I said, I gotta have both, but which one would I get if I, if I really had to choose? At this point, and only because I already got that board, and I got that wonderful roll printer, I would choose that one, the P800 over there. That would be my go-to printer. I could do anything I want on it. 
any length that I need re realistically. I mean, 590 inches, come on. So I could do pretty much anything I want on that printer right now, the way it is. And even if I wasn't using third party, you know, it's still an excellent printer. If I need anything beyond 25 inches, then this is out, P800. If you're never going to print beyond, say, 17 by 22 prints, 17 by 25, that's a, that's a special size, by the way, then this is your printer for you because this will have the ability to not have to switch black inks. Yeah, built-in colorimeter to allow you, unlike the Epson P800, to calibrate this printer to a factory standard that it will not be in when you get it out of the box because they would have to calibrate it themselves with ink in it. It would be a humongous waste of money to do that. They expect you to do it. So during your initiation process, after you install the printhead and the ink cartridges, and it has filled all the lines and all the dampers and the internal compartments with ink, you are ready to do your nozzle check. You are ready to do your auto head alignment. And then you do your internal calibration using the paper that they provided you with, which in most cases will be about five sheets of letter size Pro Luster paper. That will bring that printer to a standard. And say, for instance, you're in Manhattan. I'm here in DC area. And you want to share a profile with me that you made on your printer that's calibrated. Well, guess what? My printer's also calibrated. That way your profile will perform identically on my printer. Such will not be the case if my printer was not calibrated. It would not be the same. There will be a slight difference. Whether you see it or not, there's always going to be a slight difference in all of these batches of printers. So many advantages, many disadvantages, pros and cons and so forth. If you don't need 25 inches or more, this is your printer. If you don't mind this taking care of you by performing cleaning cycles, because you're not going to print often enough. It knows what you're going to do. So it's going to make sure that it remains unclogged. That one will not. The P800 doesn't really care that much about your habits, your bad habits of not printing often. So it's not going to force these upon you unless you exceed a certain rather long, lengthy period of non-printing. Will it clog? Of course it will clog. Yeah. Will you use up a lot of ink unclogging it? Of course you will. You know, so either way, either way, the bottom line, regardless of which printer you get, the P800 or the Pro 1000, remember, these are not machines that are meant to be bought and then just looked at. If that is your intention, then stop right now. Don't even consider it. Okay, keep going to that lab. I hope you, you know, they get your prints correct. But if you want to have complete control, Make sure that you are committed to print often, often. Some people out there, I met one guy that had 110,000 image catalog in several hard drives, and now he wants to print. Well, sir and or madam, you can print several times a day, every single day. And I'm telling you, the amount of ink that this printer will use on cleaning cycles will be about 2% of the ink that you use to produce prints from all of those beautiful images you have saved. If you don't do that, then it'll be more like 90% of the ink you use will be used for cleaning cycles. And that ink just goes bye-bye. It never sees the light of day. P800, the same thing. Please make sure you print. And again, the only difference is the one that would seal the deal for me would be if I need to go beyond 25 inches, that's my printer over there because the results are going to be truly excellent regardless of which one I pick. Under 25 inches, this one, over 25 inches, that baby over there. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope I didn't ruffle too many feathers. That wasn't my intention. Since I have both of them here in the house, I decided that it was time that I talk a little bit about the Epson P800, maybe show a little love toward that beautiful beast over there. That's all it is. And again, if you guys are considering either one, just make sure that you do your research. Don't go so much with the hype that you hear, especially on videos produced by either company. Listen to what other people are saying about those two printers. 
and make your decision. Don't go by the circle reviews on some of the buying sites either. Be very careful with those. Um, I hope that you can come here and trust me in what I have to offer you guys as far as videos and information. I try to find out, I try to give you my personal views, my personal experiences that maybe no one else has ever encountered, and I have, and I like to pass that on to you guys. So thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe, share, like. Check out the description below and the links, folks. Do that. If you just click watch and go, you will miss out, and then you will be asking me about things that are included down there. I don't want to be too pushy, but often people do that. I try always to look at the description because I'm always looking for links that they provide to products that they are describing in their videos. Thank you so much. Happy printing, everybody. Bye-bye.